that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come on, you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, you will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God.
Amen, amen. Hey, CPC family, it's been awesome to worship with you guys this morning. Y'all sound great. Y'all don't need to sit down. I promise I'm not as long-winded as Pastor Chris. Uh, but I'm gonna talk for just a second if that's all right. Um, next week, we have our Christmas worship experiences here at CPC. We have, we have them on Sunday and on Saturday as well. Um, but of course, we know that the following Monday is the day that universally the entire world uh, celebrates the coming of Christ, the arrival of Jesus. And the story of Jesus has light written all over it. We see at his birth, um, there was a star in the sky that led the wise men to Jesus. In uh, John chapter nine, Jesus said, as long as I am on the earth, I am the light of the earth. And then in his Sermon on the Mount, he said that we are to be the light of the world, like a city on a hill. And then of course, at his death while he was on the cross, the sky lit up with flashes of lightning. Again, light written all over his story. Here, uh, for the entire month of December, we've done something a little bit odd with our lights. Um, We've just done different shades of white uh, to make next week special. Next week, it'll be all colorful. I'm sorry if that's a spoiler. Uh, but today, I wanna do something special. If we can all take out our phones and uh, pull up our flashlight. Again, Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount that we are to be the light of the world. You now, he was talking about a spiritual light. But today, I want us to practice and show Jesus that we're willing to be the light of the world by being a physical light as we sing this next song. Let's worship.
It was about this time a couple years ago. I would show up on a Sunday morning to worship, but because of some of the things that I was carrying throughout the rest of the week, some burdens that I was holding on to, I found myself not being able to focus on my worship. And so what I decided to do is I decided to give myself permission that before I came into this building, I would lay my emotional and my spiritual baggage down at the door because I knew that when I left, they would be there waiting for me. And I have to tell you that what that did for my soul, that I could come into this building, suspend my fear, my doubt, my concerns. There came a Sunday that when I went to leave, I couldn't quite remember where I put my baggage. And I gotta tell you, I had to go home without them. Listen, I know this is a tough season for a lot of us, but I'm here to remind you that because of a gift that was given over 2,000 years ago, you can come into this building and come to these altars or make an altar wherever you are, at your seat or watching online. And within his presence, you can lay your burdens down and you don't have to go home with him. Amen? Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Happy Sunday. It's good to have you. I'm Jared, and on behalf of the Connection Point team, I wanna welcome you. And thank you for joining us. If you're watching online, thank you so much for tuning in. And if you are new here, we hope you feel loved here and welcomed here. If you haven't yet been plugged in or connected, and if you have any questions that you would like for us to answer, you can text GUEST to 573-340-4037, or you can scan the QR code on the screen. Any questions that you might have, we'd love to get to know you and answer those questions for you. Speaking of getting connected, if you have not yet joined a small group, I would encourage you to do so. You can go to the Next Steps desk out in the lobby or go to yourcpc.church slash groups. Listen, I love Sunday. I would not trade Sunday, but sometimes that Monday to Saturday stretch gets a little bit long. And so if we really want to grow, it's gonna be a little bit easier to do that together, amen? And so join a group, get fed throughout the week. Listen, there is a lot going on here at Connection Point, as a lot of you know, as most of you know, and I just wanna say, first and foremost, on behalf of the team, thank you. Thank you for worshiping with your time, with your effort, with your volunteering, and with your giving. And it's, uh, this morning, if you would like to give, there are a few different ways you can do that. You can text the amount that you would like to give to 84321. You can go online at yourcpc.church give. You can visit the drop boxes in the back of the sanctuary, or you can mail in your offering to the address on the screen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for yet another Sunday that we can gather together with friends and with family to take some time to focus on you, to focus on what you have for us in this season. Lord, we pray that you would bless the offering that we have prepared for you with a heart of worship and that you would open up our ears to hear and our hearts to understand and to receive the message you have for us this morning. And it's in your heavenly name we pray. Amen and amen. Lastly, we have a quick video for you all to watch. Here's just a little bit of what's coming up at CPC. Join us at CPC for our Christmas worship experiences as we break away from the chaos of the modern world and focus on Christ and the importance of His arrival. Our Christmas worship experiences are next weekend, Saturday, December 23rd at 5 p.m. or Sunday, December 24th at 8.30, 10, and 11.30 a.m. January 4th is the next Red Cross Blood Drive at CPC. Please schedule a donation now. Are you new to CPC and wondering what's next or how to become a part of Connection Point? Join us at Starting Point on Sunday, January 14th and learn how you can connect to the life and community of CPC. To register for any of these events or check out what else is going on, head on over to your cpc.church slash events. Now, let's get to the message. Good morning, CPC. Man, if you enjoyed worship this morning, singing to the light of the world, can we give him seven seconds of our best praise right now? Come on. Come on, online campus. You can tune right in with us. Amen. Great job. Hey, look at two people right now and say Merry Christmas to them. Hey, how many have caught on that we are one week away from Christmas, y'all? It's going to be here for you know it. In fact, next weekend, we have four worship experiences for you to invite people to. We have Saturday night at 5 o'clock. Sunday is the normal service times, 8.30, 10, 11.30. And, you know, we did this last week, and I told you we would be following back up with you this week. So, hey, how many of you have gotten your card, your arrival card, and given it away to somebody? Now, look back at those same two people you just said Merry Christmas to. Remember, we said we were going to do this last week. Look back at them and say, did you give yours away? 
All right, now don't judge them too harshly because they're probably looking back at you and asking the same question. Let's make sure none are left in the building today when you leave. Give these out, invite people to come next weekend. It's gonna be amazing. We're gonna have a great time in the Lord. Hey, yesterday we had a great time in Marble Hill. Uh, we had a huge number of people come out and uh, we did prayer in that other, at that campus location. We walked through the building and prayed over all of the future services and the people that God's gonna bring to that campus. And then we went down into Marble Hill and we had two huge groups do an outreach and uh, we served hot chocolate and gave out invite cards. We're gonna host our first interest meeting for the people of Bollinger County on that new campus on February the 18th. How many of you will join me today? Start praying now for that interest meeting on February 18th as we begin to introduce the church to the community, amen? What was so awesome about when we were there last night and handing out hot chocolate and inviting people to that meeting is no one was surprised we were there. People were walking up to our people and saying, yeah, we heard you were coming. Or yeah, we've already heard about, or yeah, someone's already told me about this. And I was like, man, that's awesome. I can't wait to see what God's gonna do there, amen? So whether here in Jackson or in Bollinger County, listen to me, I'm telling you, Cape County, Bollinger County, God's just using us to get the gospel to more and more people, amen? Let's keep in prayer, let's keep working, and let's stay humble. And by the way, again, next weekend on this campus, four services, go invite people to come, amen? In fact, let's pray about it. God, we love you. Thank you for this morning, God, as we've been uh, preaching through this series called Arrival, and we've been focusing back on you and trying to, uh, trying to make sure that we keep the focus right during this holiday season. And God, today, as we dive into this topic about the, uh, the purpose of your arrival, <clears throat> I pray that, God, you give us ears to hear, hearts to receive, minds to understand what you want to say, and faith to put it in action. And I pray that God this week, you give every one of us an opportunity to come across someone's path that you wanna to invite to come next weekend to hear about peace, to hear about how they can have peace with you, God, because of your son Jesus and, and celebrate the true meaning of Christmas. So God, give us opportunities this week to invite people, give us hearts receptive to the invitation and let everything be done for your glory and yours alone. God, do a work here and even in Bolivar County and wherever you send CPC, do a work through this group of people that only you can get the credit for, Jesus. That's our prayer. And in your name we pray and all God's people said, <laughs> come on, let's give him one more big praise if you believe that. Come on, amen, it's all about Jesus. <clears throat> amen. Well, this morning, I wanna to talk to you about the purpose of his arrival. How many of you, uh, how many of you say uh, that you, you recognize it while we were singing that third song this morning, the power a little light can have in a dark room? Right, I mean, someone said it like this, right? Darkness is just the absence of light. And a while ago when we turned the lights down in the room and, and Tyke told you to bring out your phone, I don't know if you could look around. I know in the back you didn't get the full grasp of the moment, but up here up front, I turned around and just kind of scanned the crowd. And when you see all those little flashlights, and the crazy thing about it is, is the light on your camera or, or your phone is just a little bitty light. And you got all this huge room of darkness. But how many have noticed that it only takes a little bitty light to pierce through the darkness? Isn't that amazing? A little bitty light can pierce through a great mass of darkness. And when I turned around, man, it was such an awesome sight to behold. And that's very important for us to focus in on. As Tyke said a moment ago, you can't look at the coming of Jesus and not see this image of light everywhere. Light in the darkness. Because you see, this is what some people call the most wonderful time of the year. Say that with me. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Now, when you said that, how many of you wanted to burst off in singing? Right, right? Some of you do, right? Because you, you have that connotation. It's the most wonderful time of the year, right? I mean, that's what you wanna do. You wanna sing, that's the only time I sing. It's like little snippets like that right there because that's about all you can handle. All right, and so I'm being merciful to you. But anyway, it's the most wonderful time of the year. But let's be honest, let's be honest, let's be honest. 
For some of you in this room and some of you watching online, it's not just the most wonderful time of the year, but it's also the most painful time of the year. For some folks in the midst of all the celebrations, this season, this time of the year also reminds them of despair and of hurt and of loss. For some of you, you will have an empty seat at the table this year at Christmas. And uh, this time of the year, though it's wonderful and you're celebrating, there's also that constant reminder that it's not wonderful all the time or wonderful for every person. December the 8th marked the one year anniversary of my mother moving to her heavenly residence with Jesus. Last year when our family went through Christmas, I kind of think we were still in shock and we went through the holidays and it never just really dawned on us. It was just like, you know, she was on vacation or something. It just never really dawned on us. However, I can tell you that this year, Christmas has a totally different feel for us. Um, it, the absence is, is known this year. We feel it differently. My mother's favorite color was red, and uh, she had uh, one set of red dinnerware that was her favorite, and she always decked out her dining table during the holidays with this one set uh, of red dinnerware. Now, after uh, she went home to be with the Lord and we had to sell the estate and do all of that, you know, everything gets boxed up and put away, and I hadn't thought any more about that red dinnerware until the other night when I came home and it'd been a very long day and I was tired and I walked in the house and I told you last week how I love this year's decorations at our home because Lisa didn't make me get on the roof and risk my life. All the decorations outside are low and to the ground and to that I say amen. Uh, and, but when I walked into the house, I noticed that she'd also decked out the inside of the house. Now, I have a great wife who does most of that herself and while I'm at work, so I don't have to, you know, anyway... I know some of you dudes know exactly what I'm talking about. It's like, oh, we gotta put up decorations, right? Anyway, we come, I come in, the house is all decorated, and the first thing, one of the first things my eyes catch, I mean, just 30 seconds into the house, is I see our dinner table. And Lisa had took mom's red dishes and placed them on the table. The next thing I hear is Lisa, who's in the other side of the house, and I don't even see her. She hears me walking in, and I hear immediately out of her mouth, is it too much? Now, she's not talking about is the decorations too much. She specifically, I know, because of the emotion of the moment, the connotation in her voice, she's talking about the dinnerware. Is that too much? And of course, my immediate response was, no, it's perfect. No, it was absolutely perfect perfect for me for this Christmas, right? And, and I love that moment. It made something special. The reason I'm talking about this to you today is because during the holidays, let's just admit it, for some of you, it's a wonderful time filled with nothing but joy. And for others of you, there's a, a, an emptiness, there's a hurt, there's a longing there. And what the message of Christmas is, is that in the midst of darkness, whatever your darkness feels like, maybe your, your darkness is you've not yet come to faith in Christ and you're not a Christian and you feel that separation and here everybody's talking about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus at Christmas and, and you feel something inside you're like, I, I want to know him, but I don't know him yet. Now, I'm here to tell you today there's a message of hope for you if you'll listen this morning. There's, that you can have peace with God before you leave here today. For others of you, it is the loss of someone that's not going to be at the table or at your celebration this year. For others of you, it's the pain of a broken relationship. Or for some of you, it's the guilt over an action or, or a wound of the past. And, and you're, standing, you're sitting in through this season and you're trying to sing. It's the most wonderful time of the year. But there's a gloom of darkness. Maybe it's depression. Maybe it's despair. Maybe it's stress that is glooming over you. And the whole message I wanna share with you today is that God has a word of hope for you and his name is Jesus and Jesus has come to bring light in the midst of your darkness. When we truly turn our eyes back to what Christmas is really all about and what God actually did 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem is it will help you see that our God is a God who offers guidance for those needing direction, strength for those who are weak, Comfort for those who are weary. In essence, let me tell you, he gives us hope. And the whole message of Christmas is that we serve a God of hope. 800 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the people of Israel were in a season where they didn't have much hope. 
And then they were, they were going through political turmoil, sound familiar? Social norm, uh, social culture was up in an upheaval and they were in spiritual darkness as well. Listen, I'm telling you, the devil has no new tricks. He just keeps recycling the same old ones. He just puts new faces and new names to them, okay? What you're going through today is what people have been going through for generations. And, and, and 800 years before the first Christmas, God used a prophet named Isaiah and he gave a word of hope to the world. And hope is pretty important, wouldn't you agree? Did you know that you can live 40 days without food? I don't plan to figure, find that out for myself. I'm gonna trust the medical experts who say that. Come on, somebody. I, that's why we only do 21 days of prayer and fasting in our church. We'll do 21 days. I, if you wanna do 40, you go for it, but I'm gonna let you come and tell me how it went, all right? But statistically, you can live 40 days without food, three days without water, eight minutes without air, but I would argue you can't live one second without hope. Everybody's looking for hope. It is the question on everyone's mind, countless people in countless ways. That's the question on your mind when you sit in a doctor's office or the unemployment line, or in a counselor's office. It's the question that eats us up all the time. Is there hope? 1927, an American submarine collided with a Coast Guard vessel. The submarine sank to the bottom off of the coast of Provincetown, Massachusetts. The Navy and the Coast Guard both sent divers down to survey the damage to the submarine and to inquire if a rescue mission was possible. When they got down, the divers, when they got down to the submarine, they could hear the distinct pounding of a soldier on the inside of the submarine. The more they listened to it, the more they picked up, it was Morse code. And when they listened to the code being asked, it was one question. Is there hope? We gotta have hope. And I'm telling you that, two, uh, that 800 years before Christmas, God said, in the midst of darkness, I need my people to know hope is on the way. Look with me at your Bible or your message notes. Isaiah, come on online campus, you can do this with us. We're gonna read it out loud. Isaiah chapter nine, verse two and verse six. And if you're there, let's say it together. Ready, read. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light and a light has dawned on those living in darkness. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. His name will be, come on, say these names with me, online campus, do it as well. Come on, ready? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Next weekend, we're gonna talk about that peace, but today we're gonna to narrow in on these first two uh, words, this one descriptive title of Jesus here, uh, the wonderful counselor, because Jesus is the light of the world. John 8, Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and anyone who comes to me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus has come in the midst of our darkness. Isn't this awesome? This is what we've talked about. Every sermon in this Christmas series is that God sent his son into the world, into our darkness, into our chaos to give us a word of hope. And I want you to know, no matter what darkness you're struggling with, no matter what despair you're fighting through, that if you come to Jesus, you will find he is the light of the world. And this is the message our community needs to hear. Your family, your friends, your neighbors need to hear this. Your classmates need to know this. There is hope in this world, and it's a person. Not a politician, not a program. His name is Jesus. And he's a wonderful counselor. Look with me on the screen. Here's the words that Isaiah used from the Lord in Hebrew. The word wonderful there means beyond words. The word counselor, yes, means wisdom from a position of authority. 
So today what I wanna say to you is this, when you come to Jesus in the midst of your darkness, here's what you find. You will find that Jesus is the son of God who's beyond words. He's more wonderful than words can describe. And out of his authority, with his wisdom, he can guide you and give you hope if you let him. But that's just the answer. You've got to let him. You've got, I have to allow the wonderful counselor to turn the light on when it's dark. How do you do that? There are three practical steps I'm gonna give you today. These are real easy, they're very practical, but man, they are so true. Here's the first one, you ready for it? If you're gonna allow Jesus, the good counselor, the wonderful counselor, to turn the light on whenever you're going through some dark season of life, here's what you must do. You must be completely honest with the Lord. Say that with me. You must be completely honest with him. You've gotta open up. You have gotta be true, you have gotta let it out. You have gotta say what is needing to be said. You can't hold it back. Here on our staff, we actually have a rule. It's called the last 10% of honesty. Here's what we found out. Among Christians especially, we like to share 80 to 90% of the truth, but we won't share the whole truth. Because we know we gotta be respectful, our words are to be seasoned with salt. We're supposed to be a people of love and acceptance. And sometimes what you say, you're like, man, I'm afraid I won't be received right or I'll hurt their feelings or, or they won't listen to me anymore or I'll push them away. And yeah, there's a right way to say what you gotta say. Understand that. There's a right way and a right timing. But listen, you're not gonna get anywhere if you're holding back a piece of the truth. You've gotta lay it all out on the table if you wanna find healing from the Lord and allow the light to be shown in the dark times. And when it comes to God, listen, this is what we do with God. We come to God like God doesn't know it all already. Look at your neighbor and tell him, he already knows it. And he already knows all about you too. And we'll hold stuff back. We'll be in prayer like Jesus. We want your help over here. And we will selectively use our words without having to go all in. And you're not gonna get anywhere with God until you go all in. You've gotta open up. You gotta be completely honest with the Lord. Here's what I'll tell you. The safest place to be in the world is to be open with Jesus. Can I, can I say that again? There's not a safer place in the world for you when you're going through dark times than to get alone with God and get completely open. It's the safest place to be vulnerable. He's the safest one to talk to about whatever you're struggling with. I know some people be like, no, God doesn't care about that little thing or God doesn't need to hear all of that. Yes, he does. It's not that you're telling him something he doesn't know, but he's trying to do something for you and you can only get healed when you open up. Let me give you some Bible examples. In John chapter four, Jesus goes to a well in Samaria. It doesn't have to go that way, but he told his disciples, I have to go to Samaria. He goes there and there's a woman at the well that no one has having anything to do with because of her lifestyle. And Jesus says to her at one point, she wants the living water that he said he could offer her. And so Jesus puts her to a test and Jesus says, then go call your husband. Did Jesus know she didn't have a husband? Absolutely. Why did Jesus ask her this question? To see if she'd be honest, to see if she'd be open. And the woman says to Jesus, uh, the woman says, sir, I don't have a husband. Jesus says, you're right, you don't. You've had five and the man you're shacked up with now is not your husband. But I wanna tell you that day when that woman got open and honest before Jesus, she found healing, she found forgiveness and that woman became a, an evangelist to her own city. A third of the town came out to meet Jesus because of that woman's testimony. Tell you about another lady who was caught in the very act of adultery. A mob of men brought her to Jesus because her custom said if she's guilty, she could literally be stoned right there in the street in John chapter eight. Now, the funny thing is, why did they let not bring the man with her? All the women say, yeah. <laughs> I heard you over there. Hey, we're equal opportunity stoners in this church, yeah. But that sounded really bad. Do not put that out on Twitter. All right, here we go. That clip's not going out. Here we go. I have editing rights. All right, here we go. <laughs> Come back in. 
Uh, where was I? Here we go. <laughs> The crowd said, let's stone her. And Jesus started writing on the ground and said, okay, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. And one by one, all those guilty old men turned around and had to walk away. Jesus looked at the woman and said, woman, where are your accusers? She said, I don't have any. He said, you're right. Neither do I. Go sin no more. She found out that day when everybody in town wanted to stone her, Jesus didn't want to stone her. Telling you there's no safer place than to be with Jesus. But you gotta be honest. You gotta be honest. I've read about a, a blind man, and this is such an interesting story. You know, most of the time when you read about people being healed by the Lord, it's like Jesus touches them one time, everything's done, everything's great, right? But in Mark chapter eight, we read about a man who's blind. He comes to Jesus, can't see. Jesus touches him, and Jesus asks him a question What do you see now? Question Did Jesus know what he could see? Yes. What's he doing? Testing him, just like he's going to you. And he tests him and he says, what do you see now? And the man said, I see men like trees. In other words, I believe at that point he went from blindness to nearsightedness because like when I take off my glasses, every one of you, you just, you're all construed, right? I mean, everybody just kind of stretches and you're all blurred. He said, I see men like trees. Jesus had touched him a second time. The only man I know of in scripture that Jesus touches twice in order for him to be healed. But I think it's important. It's not Jesus didn't have the power. Jesus wanted to teach us something. The man had to be honest. What if the man would have said, oh no, Jesus, I see better than I did. Thank you, goodbye. He would have been a nearsighted old man the rest of his life and he wouldn't have been able to see. But because he was completely honest with the Lord, even when he didn't get everything the first time and he came back to the Lord and he said, God, I still need a touch. God touched him a second time and he went away restored. There's power when you get open and honest with God. Amen. Open up, be honest with him. Write this down. Jesus can only heal what you reveal not what you conceal. Now that is tweetable. Not the other one, that one, this one. All right, say it with me. Jesus only heals what you reveal, not what you conceal. Did you know if you wanna to come to faith in Christ, you gotta to confess to him before you can be saved? First John 1, 9, whosoever uh, confesses their sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin. How many say thank you for, you know, for that, Lord? Did you know some, there are some things in life you gotta have a friend or someone you can confide in and talk to to go through the pains of life in order to get over some of the wounds that life brings? So James chapter five says, confess, excuse me, confess your faults to one another that you may be healed. You need to be open with God and sometimes you need somebody you can confide in to talk to. Here's what psychologists have known and the Bible confirms the first step to healing is you revealing. You can't get anywhere until you open up and get honest. You're not gonna go to the next level. You're not gonna get over it. You're not gonna heal. The light can't come on until you get honest. Number two, you gotta determine that you really do wanna be healed. It's not just uh, confessing, not just opening up honestly to the Lord, but you've got to make a decision to determine you really do want to be healed. Here's what I said a moment ago, that God's going to test you. I believe that anytime we go to the Lord and we say, God, here's an area of darkness in my life. Here's a pain. Here's a hurt. Here's a disappointment. I need healing, God. I need peace. I need direction. I believe that God will sometimes uh, challenge us to make sure we're honest, but also to make sure we really do want this from the Lord, that we're not just saying words. Do you really want to be healed? Do you really want the light to come on? Do you really want peace over that situation? Do you really want guidance? Do you really want direction? Do you really want this hope that can transform your life? And so sometimes the Lord will challenge us a little bit. When you read in the Bible in Mark chapter two, uh, uh, four friends carry a paralyzed man on his mat to Jesus. Now that's being completely open and honest to the Lord. They bring a paralyzed man in front of a crowd that Jesus is preaching to and tear a hole in the roof actually. And they, Lord, they, this guy's right there in front of everybody. And all they want is Jesus, we just want you to touch and heal our buddy. 
And Jesus looks at the man and here's what he says. Jesus doesn't say, you're healed. Jesus doesn't say, all right, I got you back. He doesn't kind of you know, encourage him. Jesus just looks at him and goes, well, get up. Take your bed and walk. Now you put yourself in the position of that guy. Your whole life you've been carried around by your buddies. Your whole life you've not known the joy or the power of walking on your own legs. And all of a sudden you're getting brought in front of a crowd like this while some dude's preaching and the guy just looks at you and says, well, get up. I mean, we're not talking about you know, like stuff on TV. So I'm talking about real life, all right? Get up and walk. Why would Jesus do that? Because at that moment, the man had to make a decision. Do I really believe he is who they say he is? Can he do what he says he can do? Can I trust him? And the man got up and he picked up his bed and he walked out of the house. Amen? Amen? There's another story similar to that, but in a totally different context, but same situation. And it was, it turned out the other way. There was a rich young man who came to Jesus one day and said, Lord, what can I do to inter have eternal life? He wanted to be saved. And the Bible says, Jesus said to him, then go obey my commandments. And he said, I do that. I've been living by the commandments my whole life. But Jesus knew his heart. Jesus knew where the darkness was in the man. And in that man, his darkness was, he loved his possessions more than he loved God. And God said to him, well, then go sell everything you have and then come follow me. Think about it, think about it. Jesus invited this man to be one of his disciples. He could have been number 13. He could have took Judas's place. When Judas fell from the Lord, right? He, 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 he could have been, he, could, he was invited And the Bible says the man walked away sorrowful because he loved his possessions more than he wanted eternal life. So look up here at me. How many of you feel darkness sometimes? And maybe you're going through it right now. How many know that Jesus is the light of the world? But to be healed, you gotta reveal, you gotta get open. But now watch this, watch this. You also gotta determine that you really do want to be healed when you come to him. Because number three is, if you really want to be healed, you'll do whatever he asks you to do. Are you willing to do whatever the Lord asks you to do? And how many know that sometimes that can be a scary thing to say to the Lord? It can be a little intimidating to say, God, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. But how many know that's where the healing is found? That's where hope is found. That's where peace is found. When you come into a place in your relationship with Jesus that you can find out that if I can just be open with God, if I can have the right people around me and I can be honest with God and I really, really, really want light turned on in the midst of my darkness, that I'll do whatever the Lord says to do, I can find the peace he wants me to find. I'm telling you, when you trust him, the light can come on and he can touch you in a special way. By the way, let's just, let's just have fun with this. How many of you are teenagers or above, all the way to senior adults, how many of you ever had a parent say to you at some point in your life or a guardian or someone, how many has ever had someone say to you, come on online campus, lean into the screen, you know this too. How many has ever had someone say, go do this? to which your rebellious attitude showed up. And you said, why? To which they came back with the classic response of, because I said so. Anybody know what I'm talking about in the house? All right. I got a house full of rebellious sinners disrespectful to their parents. How about online? I mean, we're all in, we're all in this thing together, amen. <laughs> no, 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 come back in, come back in, come back in. How many of you, after some time passed by, found out <clears throat> they might have known what they was talking about after all? <laughs> no, 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 listen, all you parents out there, let me give you a word of hope and encouragement. When, you're, when your kids are little, kids when they're little thinks mom and daddy hung the moon and they can't do no wrong. Daddy can beat up everybody else's daddy. 
And mama's prettier than everybody else's mama, all right? Then you come into teenage years and you think your mom and daddy are the two dumbest people on planet Earth. (laughs) Then you get out on your own, get married, get a job, start raising kids of your own, paying your own bills. Bless God. Yeah, you're out on your own and all of a sudden mom and daddy now turn back and become the wisest counselors you can find on the planet. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Isn't it amazing how God works? That is true with our walk with God too. See, see, sometimes God will challenge you when you want him to turn the light on and he may tell you to do some things that make absolutely no sense to you in the moment. And you'd be like, God, why do you want me to go talk to her? God, do you really want me to go into that area of service or ministry? God, do you really want me to make that change? God, do you really want me to do this or that? And it might just be that God wants you to know he sees the end from the beginning. He knows what's best for you. And he's just asking you to trust him in the moment. Look up here at me. Let me tell you something. I told this to some folks here recently. Walking by faith means you trust him when you don't have all the answers. It wouldn't be called walking by faith if you knew the end from the beginning already. Trusting in the Lord is when you trust he knows what's best for you. Look at two people right now and tell them, I told you at the beginning, he has your best in mind. Online campus, just go ahead and put that down somewhere in the comments. He has your best in mind. See, the cost of a, of a blessing. How many want to be blessed today? The cost of a blessing is obedience. The cost of a blessing is for you to trust God and believe God when you can't see it, to follow him when you don't understand it. One time Jesus in John chapter six had to preach a very hard sermon and we understand it now on this side of the sermon. We know he was talking about what we do uh, uh, once a month with communion. We, we did it uh, a couple of weeks ago. We had the Lord's Supper. We're gonna do it once a month in 2024 or something like that, pretty close to it. And um, it's when we take bread and the cup of juice or wine and, and we remember the body and the blood of Jesus poured out on at the cross for our salvation. Jesus was actually preaching on that, but he didn't go through and explain it all. He just kind of looked at a big crowd like this one day and he said, unless you come eat my body and drink my blood, you have no part in me. And the Bible says a lot of his followers, he had hundreds of followers at that time, a lot of his followers turned their back on Jesus and said, this is too hard. And they walked away and they never followed him again. In John chapter six, he turns to his 12 disciples and he asks this question, do you want to go away too? And I love Peter's response. You see it there on your message notes? Peter said, Lord, where will we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. I want you to think about that. How many believe Jesus is the light of the world? That he can turn light on in the midst of whatever darkness you're facing? then you're gonna have to trust him even when you don't understand him. Because at the end of the day, you gotta come to this great conclusion. Who else you gonna go to? He's the wonderful counselor. He's beyond words and he can give you guidance from a position of authority that no one else can. He's got your back. You can trust him. Amen? He loves you. If I could sum it up this way, here's your big takeaway. Trusting the Lord is what turns the light on in your life. I wanna challenge you today to trust him, to trust the Lord. You know, John, when he was writing his gospel in verse four, he wrote these words, in him was life. It was the life and that life was the light of men and that light shines in the darkness and yet the darkness doesn't overcome it. See, it doesn't matter what the darkness is you're facing, no matter the darkness you're struggling through, the good news of the hope of Jesus is, if you come to God with all your struggles and all your pain and all of your hurt and all of your hangups, listen to me, no darkness you face is stronger than the light of Jesus. 
Verse nine says, and the true light gives light to everyone and he's coming into the world and he has come. That's why we celebrate Christmas. That's why we invite people to come to church. He is the light of the world. And anyone that follows him doesn't walk in darkness. Amen? Here's what Jesus says. Matthew chapter 11. You ready? Jesus says, come. Come to me. All of you who are weary and heavy burdened, and you will find rest for your soul. How many want to find that rest from the Lord today? Would you stand with me? Heads bowed all over the room, no one looking around. Did you know that Jesus said in John 10, he'd come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly? I promise you today, if you look to Jesus, he lightens the load, he directs your steps, and he strengthens you for your journey. Let him, let him today. For some of you, you don't know the Lord yet. You haven't came to faith yet. How about today? Today's a great day to be saved. Doesn't matter who you are or where you've been. If you call on the name of the Lord, he'll save you. Others of you, you're believers, but you've got some hurt and some struggles you're going through, some pain. He's here to help you through it. Would you pray with me? If you want to be saved today, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, today I give you my heart give you my life. I I pray you turn the light on in my darkness and forgive me of all my sin. Today, Jesus, I trust you as my Lord and my Savior, and I'm going to follow you from this day forward. I receive you now in Jesus' mighty name. If you're a Christian here today and you need God to turn the light of hope on in your life, why don't you just call on him right now? If you just need the Lord to turn the light on, would you pray this prayer, Lord Jesus? I believe you are the son of God. You're the light of the world. Today, I just need you to turn the light on. Here's my pain, my hurt, my unforgiveness, my sin. Give it to him. Here it is, Lord. Meet me where I am. Put the right people around me. And Lord, bring healing. Give me the healing that I need. Turn the light on. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said. Let's worship. And while we worship, if you'd like someone to pray with, pray over you, we have prayer team members who will meet you at any of these altars or out in the lobby, online campus. While we're singing, there are pastors right now at a computer ready to pray with you online. All you gotta do is reach out right there in the comments. So come on, this is our time. Let's let Jesus turn the light on. Amen? Let's sing.
Praise God. Praise God. If you prayed that prayer with Pastor Chris today of salvation, there will be people out in the lobby holding up a red bag. Please go and find one of those guys. We have resources that we want to give you to help start your relationship with Jesus today. Hey, next week, we have our, our Christmas uh, services on Sunday and on Saturday as well. Please invite your friends, your family, your coworkers, and we'll see you all next week. Be blessed.